The affluent London borough of Mayfair has long been associated with grand hotels and gourmet restaurants, but hidden amongst the art galleries and international embassies sits an innocuous Georgian property that was once known as one of London's most haunted houses. What was the nameless horror of Berkeley Square? The idea of a building or place that is plagued by paranormal and inexplicable occurrences is to be found throughout all of the different geographies and societies that span the globe. From the ghostly forests of Mount Fuji in Japan, to the horrifying deaths at Australia's Monte Cristo homestead and the Myrtles plantation haunting in Louisiana, all cultures throughout the ages feature at least one site deemed hostile and harmful to those electing to venture inside. We have already featured some of these cases, including the mysterious happenings at Borley Rectory and Cellar Neues Rathaus. The events that took place at number 50 Berkeley Square are just as disturbing, and much like the incidents witnessed at the aforementioned properties, just as impossible to resolve using conventional explanation. Throughout the 19th century, the house would claim the lives of at least four of its inhabitants as well as a number of other lives that have not been officially verified. The story of vengeful spirits, arcane rituals and demonic entities populated the pages of London's newspapers, attracting both paranormal investigators and foolhardy thrill-seekers. The property itself resembled any other traditional townhouse, until the tragic demise of one of its residents in 1789. A young lady by the name of Adeline was found dead on the pavement outside. She had either fallen or was pushed from the second floor bedroom window, possibly whilst attempting to escape the abuses of her overbearing uncle. Soon after, the local constabulary began receiving reports of a female figure desperately clinging to the same window ledge before screaming and disappearing into thin air. Subsequent residents encountered a spectral female figure walking the corridors. Another ghost of a young girl murdered by her nanny was also reported. Furniture moved of its own accord, and strange smells emanated from upstairs. One former Prime Minister, George Canning, purchased the address in 1800. In his diaries, he made reference to hearing unexplained sounds and loud bangs whilst living in the property. Following Canning's death in 1827, the house was rented out by the new owner, Elizabeth Curzon. Bizarre rumours circulated throughout high society in relation to one of her lodgers, Thomas Myers. The dysfunctional son of a Tory MP, Myers moved into the address with his bride-to-be. When she jilted him at the altar, Myers became a recluse, never seen outside save to open the door for his servant. Unable to tolerate the rejection, Myers took to sleeping in the daytime and was only glimpsed moving around by candlelight during the hours of darkness. He could be heard shouting and making strange noises at night by his neighbours, and the rumour began that he was using the cellar to dabble in the occult, attempting to win back his fiancée. The cellar features in the story of another lodger, Mr Dupree. It is alleged that Dupree's brother was mentally unstable and was imprisoned in the lower floors rather than being committed to a local institution. He remained cut off from society until his eventual death fed meals via a hole cut into the cellar door. But as disturbing as these torrid tales are, they are trifling compared to the property's most notorious house guest, a sinister entity that became known as the Nameless Horror of Berkeley Square. The first incident attributed to this murderous creature occurred in 1840. 
A 20-year-old student named Robert Warboys was drinking at a tavern in the neighbouring borough of Holborn when the subject of the infamous townhouse was discussed. It's unclear if it was morbid curiosity or some form of drunken dare that spurred Warboys to act, but he subsequently arrived at the front door of 50 Berkeley Square in an intoxicated state, demanding to spend the night inside. Through a combination of sheer personality and financial incentive, the drunken Warboys overcame the reluctant landlord's protests, but was only permitted to sleep in the second floor bedroom under two strict conditions. The first was that he remain armed at all times, with a pistol that was thrust into his hands. The second was that if he saw anything unusual, he was to pull a cord hanging beside the bed. This was connected to a bell that would summon assistance. Accepting these terms, he headed to the upper floors and settled in for the night. An hour passed before the deathly silence of the house was broken by the frantic ringing of the bell, immediately followed by the deafening report of a pistol shot. It took seconds for the landlord to sprint up the stairs, where he found Warboys in an incomprehensible condition. The traumatised youth was backed into a corner, the empty pistol still raised in self-defence. There was a hole in a nearby wall where the shot had impacted, but the landlord could see no one else inside the room. Despite repeated efforts, Warboys was unable to explain what had occurred, and after a short time, he rushed from the house into the darkness of the night. More than 30 years would pass before another soul dared to sleep in the upstairs room, with similarly horrifying results. The man was Lord George Littleton, and he took the precaution of bringing his own gun with him. Littleton was an outlandish character, a former MP and Privy Council. He was once offered the Greek throne by the government. An accomplished writer with an obsession for all things paranormal, in 1872, he announced his intention to explain what was happening inside Berkeley Square. Armed with a hunting rifle, he was allowed to stay in the same room which Warboys had occupied many years before, and settled in for the night. The aristocrat was woken in the early hours by a strange noise, and he immediately reached for his weapon. Exiting the bed, Littleton looked for the source of the sound, tracing it to a darkened corner adjacent to the bedroom window. The sound stopped, and then, something suddenly sprung at him from the shadows. Littleton caught a glimpse of a disgusting brown mass of tentacles rushing towards him, akin to some deformed sea creature, before he fired. Blinded by the flash and smoke from the rifle's barrel, he immediately retreated and reloaded, but when he regained his sight, the creature was gone. All that remained was a gaping hole in the wall, cartridge casings, and some form of sludgy residue. Six years later, the property was purchased by a new owner with two teenage daughters. The family employed a local girl as a maid, and it was eventually agreed that her fiancé, a naval captain by the name of Kentfield, could also move in. The maid set about preparing the top floor bedroom for her and her betrothed to live in, before tragedy struck. One afternoon, the house was filled with the sounds of terrified screaming. The occupants ran upstairs and found their maid shrieking in the bedroom. Her eyes were fixed on one corner of the room, and she was repeating, don't let it touch me, over and over again. The family were unable to calm the girl down, and after a doctor arrived, she was committed to the local sanatorium. Despite this, the anguished Kentfield resolved to spend that night in the bedroom, taking his service pistol for protection. As the restless occupants later tried to settle, there was a shout of terror from upstairs, followed by the sound of a single gunshot. Kentfield was found lying in the middle of the bedroom, having apparently committed suicide. It was confirmed the following morning that the maid had also passed away that same evening. By far the most graphic and haunting description of whatever was stalking the upper floors of the house came in December 1887. A warship, HMS Penelope, arrived in Portsmouth for refitting. With her crew given leave, the majority of the sailors gravitated towards London for the festive season. As the capital's bars and taverns closed their doors on Christmas Eve, two enlisted men, Robert Martin and Edward Blunden, found themselves without a place to stay. The drunken and meandering route they took through the city just happened to lead them through Berkeley Square, where number 50 stood, 
by now abandoned and vacant. Having broken in, the two sailors fatefully elected to spend the night on the second floor, due to the damaged condition of the lower levels. They settled down and slipped into a deep sleep, assisted by the alcohol they had consumed throughout the evening. At some point during the night, Blunden awoke suddenly. As he looked around the room, he noticed a shapeless form, making its way across the floor, heading for Martin. As it slowly and deliberately moved towards the sleeping man, the creature left a trail of slime behind it and made a soft squelching noise. The terrified sailor's eyes desperately darted from side to side, catching sight of a metal poker lying on the floor just beyond his reach. As the strange intruder closed on Martin, Blunden grabbed for the rusty tool. In a heartbeat, the creature launched across the room, dodging the waving poker and lunging for Blunden's face. Martin woke to panic screams, seeing Blunden desperately trying to free himself from something wrapped around his neck. In the ambience from the outside streetlights, Martin witnessed tentacles tightening around his crewmate's throat, attached to a sinister, bulky form that pulsated and twitched. His nerve broken, the sailor abandoned his struggling friend and fled the building, encountering a patrolling police constable a few streets away. When the two men returned to number 50, they found Blunden's lifeless body lying outside the front door. Some newspapers reported that it was impaled and torn on the metal railings. In others, it was twisted and broken as a result from falling from the second floor. The terrified Martin was arrested and interviewed, but ultimately released without charge. Like the stories of so many other iconic haunted sites, as the technology and means to effectively document them evolved, the reported incidents at the location quickly petered out. With the advent of photographic and audio recording equipment, sightings of the nameless horror ceased. The house was sold to the British Petroleum Company and then onto an antique book dealership. And whilst the current owners have confirmed that strange bangs and odd noises could still be heard, there have been no visual sightings of ghosts or cryptids. So what was the malevolent force that stalked this seemingly ordinary Mayfair townhouse for a century and even claimed some of the occupants' lives in the process? There was no shortage of speculation in the press at the time of the incidents, ranging from the straightforward to the outlandish. Naturally, as is usually the case in these situations, the most grounded and logical reasoning provided by sceptical commentators was that there never really was anything supernatural taking place at the address. The more fantastical elements included in the recounting of each incident were merely excuses used to cover up more sinister events. The drunken young man who could not face up to losing a bet, who manufactured an impossible situation to get himself out of it. The fading novelist, sensationalising a publicity stunt in order to sell more books. Two sailors involved in a fight that ended badly, the survivor concocting a horror story to mask his misdeeds. Further still, it has been suggested that many of the incidents were completely fabricated to begin with. Over the years, the house became a dilapidated ruin, its broken windows and gloomy interior preying on the imaginations of passers-by and those willing to concoct stories about a cursed past. Moving on past the idea of deliberate falsehoods and mistruths, there is also the possibility that the established stories and myths already surrounding the house might have had a severely negative effect on those who dwelt within. In the case of both Warboys and Littleton, both men were actively seeking some form of otherworldly experience, and so they may have misinterpreted or imagined some of the things they thought they were seeing. The same applies to Blunden and Martin, who like Warboys, were severely intoxicated during their brief stay at the address. In the half-darkness, it is possible that some rodent or semi-domesticated animal may have been mistaken for something more sinister. And in the case of Kentfield, could the grieving naval officer have been driven past the point of sanity by the apparent loss of his fiancée, leading him to visualise horrors that simply were not there in the room with him? If these events really did take place, then given the lengthy time frame over which the incidents occurred and the diverse range of people that were involved, not everyone is so quick to embrace such a straightforward explanation. Fear and trepidation alone could not have resulted in the tragic and senseless deaths of Kentfield and his fiancée, and the descriptions of the nocturnal attacker detailed in the accounts of the survivors are remarkably similar. 
despite their encounters occurring many years apart. One of the more sensationalist ideas put forward by the media was that arcane activities conducted by the likes of Myers and Dupree had opened a doorway to another world, allowing demonic creatures or entities the ability to enter our world via a gateway in the basement of the house. It would be another 50 years before author H.P. Lovecraft would first describe the demonic being Cthulhu in his works, and the Berkeley Square entity bears an uncanny resemblance to the ancient European myths and writings he would use to describe his creation. The fact that people from different levels of the social hierarchy were involved in such identical occurrences further minimises the possibility of collusion or deceit. How could it be that the description of the beast offered by Littleton, a former government minister and member of the aristocracy, could be so similar to that of two drunken working class sailors, conscripted off the streets to fight for their country? Another theory examined by reporters of the era also bears merit, offering the possibility that the creature was some form of cryptid, or an exotic variety of cephalopod that had arrived in the city via one of the many boats travelling up and down the Thames. This invasive species could either have been hideously deformed by the high level of pollutants in its new environment, or was naturally repulsive in appearance. The intruder eventually accessed the house via the city's labyrinthine sewer system, aggressively defending the new home it had found. Finally, it may also be possible that over the years, the people living at the address each succumbed to psychotic episodes, induced by some form of chemical or material that had been introduced into the premises. Could such an item have been brought into the house by the likes of Thomas Myers, and secreted away somewhere in the proximity of the second floor bedroom, its effects slowly seeping into the household over time, and affecting people exposed to it? Merely setting out to discredit the players involved in these stories though, does not fully hide the fact that something very strange, and very sinister was occurring within the property, if indeed these events really took place. The number of deaths and suspicious incidents certainly unnerved the local police enough to place a sign within the household, forbidding anybody other than the owners from accessing the top two floors. The sign remains at the property to this day, a sad testimony to the human suffering that has become part of the building's history, whether genuine or not. Given the lack of available evidence, save for the testimony of those involved, it proves problematic to hypothesise precisely what took place inside the house. We can never know for certain if there was indeed something tangible and malevolent lurking within the walls of the building, or if it was the cumulative effect of so many years of ghost stories and strange rumours associated with the house, causing a significant level of hysteria in visitors, clouding their thoughts and judgement, often with tragic consequences. Whatever the case, the anguish and suffering that took place at 50 Berkeley Square remains a cause for great sadness, and we can only be grateful that whatever force was at work has now seemingly come to an end.